Welcome to the technical webinar, a pre-application webinar for RFA RM22001, limited competition, transformative research to address health disparities and advance health equity at minority serving institutions. I'm Yvonne Ferguson, a program leader at the NIH Common Fund. This funding opportunity announcement is supported by the NIH Transformative Research to Address Health Disparities and Advanced Health Equity Initiative. Next slide. We want to begin by acknowledging the Transformative Health Disparities Working Group members. Next slide. And co-chairs, next slide, that have contributed to this effort. The co-chairs are Dr. Janine Austin Clayton, Associate Director for Research on Women's Health and Director of the Office of Research on Women's Health, Dr. Joshua Gordon, Director of the National Institute of Mental Health, Dr. Eliseo Perez Estable, Director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, Dr. David Wilson, Director of the Tribal Health Research Office, and Dr. Shannon Zink. Director of the National Institute of Nursing Research. Next slide. It's also my pleasure to introduce the webinar panelists. They include Dr. Cheryl Ann Boyce, Program Leader at the NIH Common Fund, Dr. Allison Brown, Program Director at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, Dr. Shalina Bynum, Program Director at the National Institute of Nursing Research, Dr. Nathan Stinson, Jr., Director of the Division of Community Health and Population Science at the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, Commander Nadra Tias, Program Director at the NIH Common Fund. Next slide. Dr. Aruna Bahera, Scientific Review Officer at the Center for Scientific Review. Ms. April Harrison, Grants Management Specialist at the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research. And Dr. April O, Senior Advisor for Implementation Science and Health Equity at the National Cancer Institute. Next slide. As for the webinar agenda, after a brief overview of the Transformative Health Disparities Research Working Group and the NIH Common Fund, we will discuss the purpose of the funding opportunity announcement and provide additional information, including eligibility and scientific requirements. Next, we'll talk about the application structure and provide budget information. Then we'll talk about the cooperative agreement mechanism, as well as provide peer review information and the review criteria. We will have a brief presentation on advancing health equity through implementation science. And finally, we will answer your questions. Next slide. Before we provide you with more details about the funding opportunity announcement, I want to provide an overview of the NIH Common Fund. The Common Fund is under the Office of the Director and managed in partnership with the NIH institutes and centers. These programs are designed to address emerging scientific opportunities and pressing challenges in biomedical research that no single NIH institute or center can address on its own, but are of high priority for the NIH as a whole. These programs are intended to foster innovative ideas with transformative impact, change paradigms, provide infrastructure to support research, develop innovative tools and technologies, and or provide fundamental foundations for research that can benefit the broad biomedical research community. As displayed in the image, these programs are developed to be transformative, synergistic, catalytic, cross-cutting, and unique. Next slide. The goal of the NIH Common Fund is to move the NIH mission forward faster. It does this by supporting this, a series of bold scientific programs designed to catalyze discovery and an area of research relevant to the NIH mission. These areas of research are cross-cutting rather than focusing on one disease or organ system and advance the missions of multiple NIH institutes and centers. Common Fund programs are designed so that each deliverable will spur subsequent biomedical advances that otherwise would not be possible without our strategic investment. Next slide. The Common Fund programs often align with existing efforts across NIH. And this initiative aligns with the NIH Unite initiative 
and other efforts to address and end structural racism. Specifically, the UNITE initiative aims to identify actions to end structural racism and racial inequities throughout the biomedical research enterprise. Part of ending structural inequities in biomedical research will be to ensure NIH supported research benefits the health of all populations, especially those whose health is negatively impacted by racism. And for this reason, conducting new research into health disparities, minority health, and health equity is an important goal of UNITE. And thus this funding opportunity announcement supporting transformative research to address health disparities and advance health equity aligns with NIH's UNITE initiative. Next slide. Now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Allison Brown, to talk about the purpose of the funding opportunity announcement, the eligibility information, as well as the scientific requirements. Thank you, Yvonne, for sharing that overview. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Allison Brown, and I'm a program director at NHLBI, and also serve as the working group coordinator for this Common Fund program. So now we would like to share more about the purpose of this limited competition RFA. And as Yvonne mentioned, the Common Fund program aims to be transformative and innovative. And the main goal of this initiative is to fund research studies that propose unusually innovative research projects that have the potential to have a major impact in developing, implementing, or disseminating innovative and effective interventions to prevent, reduce, or eliminate health disparities and advance health equity. So important things to note is that no preliminary data are required for the application. And to be transformative, we are seeking projects that clearly demonstrate a compelling potential to produce a major impact in addressing health disparities and advancing health equity. And this should be based on presented evidence and logic. Next slide. So there are a few eligibility criteria that we would like to mention. So in terms of eligibility, investigators must come from either a public or private institution of higher education. And in alignment with NIH's goals to end structural racism and racial inequities throughout the biomedical research enterprise, we always encourage minority serving institutions to apply. So these include Hispanic serving institutions, historically black colleges and universities, tribally controlled colleges and universities, Alaska Native and Native Hawaiian serving institutions, as well as Asian American, Native American Pacific Islander serving institutions. Next slide. So additional eligibility criteria are listed here. Uh, so applica applicants must be based in the US or its territories. They must also be a part of an institution that has received less than $25 million per year in total costs for NIH research projects grants, also known as RPGs, um, in each of the preceding two fiscal years. So if you're uncertain of this, uh, we encourage you to contact your institution to confirm eligibility, and you can also confirm this by using NIH Reporter. So applicants must also be a part of an institution that awards undergraduate and or graduate degrees in biomedical sciences. They must also have a historical and current mission to educate students from any of the populations that have been identified as underrepresented in biomedical research as identified and defined by the National Science Foundation. And this includes African Americans or Blacks, Hispanic or Latino Americans, American Indians and Alaska Natives, Native Hawaiians, US Pacific Islanders and persons with disabilities. Uh, an institution could also have a documented history of recruiting, training, and or educating and graduating underrepresented students or delivering healthcare services to medically underserved communities. So I'm going to cover the scientific requirements for this RFA. As noted in the slides, all subjects must include an intervention component. They should have development and testing of a novel intervention. They should have new implementation dissemination strategies for evidence-based interventions, and they should provide a novel exa examination of program policy interventions that provide innovative insight into their effectiveness. All projects must also be transformative. Projects that reflect ideas substantially different from mainstream concepts and have high potential to lead to major improvements in health. All projects must include a focus 
on one or more NIH designated populations that experience health disparities in the US. That can be um, Blacks, African Americans, Hispanics, Latinos, American Indians and Alaska Natives, Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders, socioeconomically disadvantaged populations, underserved rural populations, and sexual and gender minorities. All projects must document or demonstrate meaningful collaboration and partnership with local community engaged leaders that represent the community's populations of focus. This list is not exhaustive, so please read the RFA carefully for additional requirements and instructions. These are also not required, but encouraged. Community prioritization of the research questions, um, that are the health conditions topics most important to the communities involved in the project. Also think about if there are cross-cutting issues such as social determinants of health across sectors, priority areas of multiple NIH institutes and centers are not required again, but are encouraged. Also think about multiple level interventions that address two or more levels of influence of health and behavioral and behavioral outcomes, interventions that go beyond the level of the individual. Transdisciplinary and intersectoral collaborations, such as transportation, housing, and food systems, again, they're not required, but encouraged. This is not an exhaustive list, so please read the RFA carefully for additional areas and topics that are encouraged. This application uses the standard R application form the SF424 application guide, but uses it in an unconventional way. For the specific aims page, you would not use the listed, you would not list your objectives of the research. Instead, use as a one page distillation of the research and why it is well aligned with the spirit of the RFA. There are two six sections for this, the significance, innovation and impact, and the next section should be entitled Insight and Rationale. The questions to consider when completing these two sections include what are the challenge, what is the challenge or opportunity that is the focus of the proposed research? Why is this significant? What is the overall approach you are proposing? What are the most original or innovative aspects of your application? If successful, what would be the impact on the scientific understanding and ultimately health disparities and health equity. For the insight and rationale section, questions to consider would include, what is the fundamental new insight that is motivating the proposed research? What is the underlying logic or rationale that provides support for pursuing this insight despite little or no preliminary data? Next slide. Under the research strategy, you would not use it the you would not use it the conventional way, pro providing that substantial preliminary data and experimental details are not required for this RFA. Instead, use the um, the research strategy section to address these important aspects of the proposed research. You would provide an overview. And that would talk about the importance of the research to set the context for the project, talk about your approach, which would describe the underlying logic and ensure the project's robustness and rigor. Also innovation, you would explain why the research should be considered innovative, discuss the appropriateness for this RFA and address why the research is well suited to the goals of this RFA and not a more traditional research grant program. And finally, a timeline. Describe the transformative impact within the project period and include critical decision points and possible alternative paths. Next slide. For the budget, the budget is not limited, but needs to reflect the actual needs of the proposed project. Large budgets will be, must be well justified. This is intended to provide flexibility for research. There is no requirement that you have a large budget, but it should be based on the research needs. 
request in excess of $250,000 direct cost in any year require detailed budgets. Prior approval from NIH is not required before submitting a budget exceeding $500,000 in annual direct cost, and the project maximum period for this is five years. Now, I will pass it over to my colleague, April Harrison, who will talk about the cooperative agreement mechanism. Thank you, Yvonne. This RFA will be using the U01 cooperative agreement mechanism. A cooperative agreement is used when there is substantial federal or scientific or programmatic involvement. Substantial involvement means that after award, NIH scientific or program staff will assist, guide, coordinate, or participate in project activities. The NIH purpose is to support and stimulate the awardee's activities. It is not to assume direction, prime responsibility, or adopt a dominant role. Next slide, please. This is a sample of the terms and conditions in the award. Please pay special attention to section six in the RFA for the complete list of terms and conditions of the award. The PIPD provides scientific leadership for all aspects of the study. Finalized study designs, milestones, including a robust statistical plan for analysis with NIH staff, provide summaries of progress towards goals and milestones. Milestones will be reviewed at, the, at least annually, negotiate new milestones as appropriate working with NIH staff. The project scientists will consult the PIs, PDs regarding study design, milestones, prior to finalizing the study design as needed thereafter. They also provide scientific and programmatic support, examples, input on experiment, clinical approaches, study protocol, data analysis, etc. They will review the progress of the study. The program, the project scientists will not make decisions about the funding of the project. And you have the program official who reviews activities to ensure objectives are met. And NIH guidelines are as follows. They have the option to withhold support if technical performance requirements or milestones are not met. They conduct special reviews of the project as the, pro, as the PO deems necessary. Now I will turn the rest of this presentation over to my colleague, Aruna Bahira, who will provide peer review information. Thank you. Thank you, April. So now I will go over the peer review process and the review criteria. Next slide. The NIH Center for Scientific Review will convene a special emphasis panel to review all the applications submitted against this FOA. And so you do not need to recommend any study section assignment. All applications will be reviewed in the panel named GRG1 MOS T. However, you may identify three or four broad expertise areas in your application. You can add that either in your cover letter or using the assignment request form while submitting your application. All applications will receive a written critique, but only those applications which are deemed to have highest scientific and technical merit will be discussed during the meeting and will be assigned an overall impact score. All applications will receive a summary statement uh, within 30 days from the meeting completion. Next slide. The letter of intent is due approximately 30 days prior to the application due date. It is not required. However, the information you provide in this letter of intent is very helpful and allows us to estimate potential workload and plan the review process. To submit a uh, letter of intent, you can uh, provide, uh, we encourage you to uh, provide this information, which are descriptive title of the proposed activity, the name of the PI and the uh, address, all the key personal names and all the affiliated institutions and also refer the FOA name and submit it to this email address. Next slide, please. Now I will go over the review criteria and these are just the key points. This is not exhaustive. Please refer to the section five of the application review information in the FOA. The, uh, for, to review the applications, reviewers will emphasize the conceptual framework, the level of innovation, 
and the potential to significantly advance our knowledge, understanding, or capability. Reviewers also will look for the potential for transformative impact, not for preliminary data. And the applications will be evaluated based on five score review criteria, which include significance, investigators, innovation, approach, and environment in the determination of scientific merit and give a score in a scale of one to nine, one being the best. Now I'll go over little detail about these five score review criteria. Next slide, please. Coming to significance, reviewers should evaluate if the application, if the study has a clear scientific transformative potential, is the prior research that serves as the foundation of the study rigorous? Does the project address issues that are critical and relevant to one or more populations experiencing health disparities? To evaluate investigators, reviewers should ask, are the PIs and all the collaborators and researchers involved in the application well suited to conduct the project. If there are multiple PIs, if the investigators have complementary and integrated expertise, are their leadership approach, governance and organizational structure appropriate for the project? For innovation, does the application provide novel or innovative insights into improving the health of one or more populations experiencing health disparities? To evaluate approach, have the investigators included plans to address weaknesses in the rigor of the prior research that serves as the foundation of the study? Have the investigators presented strategies to ensure a robust and unbiased approach as appropriate for the proposed work? Have they presented adequate plans to address relevant biological variables in their study design? Does the research use a community engaged approach or socio-cultural constructs that reflect the desires of the community and engage the community in research design and conduct? To evaluate the environment, reviewers will um, assess if the scientific environment in which the work will be done contribute to the probability of success and does the project provide evidence of community engagement and support as appropriate? So these are the key criterion for specific to this FOA. So use this criterion while preparing the, your applications. Now I will hand over to my colleague, uh, April O, who will present on advancing health equity through implementation science. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aruna. Um, as you're forming your application, some of you may be interested in incorporating implementation science. So I'd like to share a bit of background about implementation science and opportunities to consider advancing health equity through implementation science in your applications. Next slide. So one of our biggest challenges in health and in public health is getting our evidence-based interventions, guidelines, practice recommendations into everyday clinical practice. And this has certainly contributed to health disparities and health inequalities. And what this slide does is it's illustrating the problem of moving innovations into practice. So what this displays are findings from a study from 2000 from Bayless and Bourne, and it asks us the question, let's assume that, that the end product of our research is highlighted in a high impact publication. So what happens next? What you see in the middle is the rough publication pathway. We complete our original research, we submit it for publication, and hopefully it's accepted, published, and gets into various databases and ultimately forms a guideline or basis for, develop, basis for guideline development and implemented. On the left side, you see all the ways that we lose valuable evidence. Um, it's increasingly difficult to publish no, ne negative findings. Sometimes our study studies are smaller and don't get picked up in larger surveys of the literature, and sometimes they just get lost. So the right side of the picture estimates how long it takes to get to each one of these steps. Uh, next slide, next. The conclusion in um, their publication was, as some of you have seen, is that it takes about 17 years to get 14% of original research to benefit patient care. And as a research and practice community, we can do a better job. Next slide. So some may ask the question, well, maybe we don't have the right interventions. And that could certainly be the case, but the problem goes beyond the strength of our uh, evidence um, of poor effectiveness. An intervention is going to be only so good as to how and whether it's adopted by different systems within different communities. 
We also have to make an effort to identify those practitioners who can then be trained to deliver that intervention. And it's not that ju not just that. We could do a better job in engaging and training providers. And it's not just that. We need to also make sure that once those trained providers are able to deliver that intervention, that they can reach all the people who could potentially benefit from it. And even if we were to get halfway there on each of these steps, even assuming perfect access, adherence, dosage, and maintenance, we're still down to a fraction of the benefit that we thought we were going to have with that inter magical intervention. And again, we want to make sure we don't assume that these steps are going to happen by themselves. Next slide, please. And that's where implementation science can potentially come in. Uh, implementation science intends to bridge the gap between research, practice, and policy by building a knowledge base about how health information, effective interventions, and new clinical practices, guidelines, and policies are communicated and integrated for public health and healthcare service use. It's different from dissemination research, which is a scientific study of targeted distribution of information and intervention materials to a specific public health or clinical practice audience. The intent there is to understand how best to communicate and integrate knowledge and associated evidence-based interventions. Implementation research is a scientific study of the use of strategies to adopt and integrate evidence-based health interventions into clinical and community settings to improve individual outcomes and population health. Next slide. So in implementation research, we try to draw a contrast from what we are used to seeing in typical clinical trials, where we tend to focus on the what as seen on the left and all the way to the right, the health outcomes that we're trying to improve. And this model from Proctor starts to illustrate some of this and what we're trying to do in implementation science. Uh, next, most clinical trials are predicated on the idea that if we focus on the left and if we focus on the right, we will get the answers that we need. But we jump over that important middle. Next, and that's the question of how the implementation strategies that will support the ability of those interventions to be delivered in a whole variety of different settings in which we're delivering our interventions. And importantly, what are the implementation outcomes? So if we get the implementation right, we should see that our interventions are deemed feasible, acceptable to the populations that are using them, and that they're also reaching as many people as possible in an equitable way, and that they're sustained over time and have high rates of uptake. And we're also trying to understand some of the costs of those. Uh, next, please. So when we're starting to focus on implementation science, what we're ideally starting to do is seeing beyond the usual is that we have an influence on the implementation outcomes, which has a benefit on the service systems and also on the population level. Next, please. These tools in implementation science offer an opportunity, next, to advance health equity by advancing equitable implementation of innovations but also applying an equity lens is essential in IS to reduce health disparities. Next slide. So health equity and implementation science are two areas of science that are much aligned in tackling these complex challenges of addressing inequalities. And here I just wanna highlight some areas where these approaches align. So why is an equity lens important in implementation science? First, our evidence-based interventions may be inequitably applied to those communities or settings that have more resources. So it's important to keep in mind that equity question. Pragmatic or real world um, approaches require an understanding of the real world, including the local history, resources, local capacity that can ultimately impact disparities and also long-term sustainability of these interventions. And essentially, um, it's important uh, because community or stakeholder engagement is so essential in advancing equity um, and equitable approaches, but it's also an important com component within implementation science models and frameworks. And there's a strong emphasis within both areas of science on context, multi-level approaches, the role of interacting systems, in intersecting systems such as, so such as social determinants of health, which may be barriers or facilitators to implementation. Next slide. 
So this is a table from Proctor 2012 manuscript on 10 key ingredients for your implementation research proposal. So should you decide to uh, submit an implementation oriented proposal, this is a great resource in thinking about 10 key ingredients for that proposal. I have some resources here to the right, um, citations and some example grant applications that you could take a look at. What I'm going to be doing is focusing on the third key element, which is on the conceptual model and theoretical selection. And um, the key question here is, does the proposal delineate a clear conceptual framework theory or model that informs the design and variables that are being selected and tested in the proposal? Next slide. So this is a great tool I have here on the left side. This is at dissemination-implementation.org. Theories, models, and frameworks are foundational for generalizing implementation efforts and implementation findings. So this theories and models um, website is open access and is a searchable tool of DNI theories, models, and frameworks. And there are some key considerations as you're selecting your models um, with an equity lens. Our models, including examination of the influence of multiple levels in both the inner and outer context of a particular setting, are they considering stakeholder and community engagement, those roles and specific measures? Will this theory model or framework include um, measures or areas to examine the influence of equity related contextual factors or social determinants? And how can my team or community operationalize health equity by using this model to examine process and outcomes? I'd also like to suggest taking a critical self-reflective process of you as the investigator, your team and your community partner on the role of bias, discrimination and structural racism and the lived experience of communities that you're working with as you're selecting these models. Sometimes it can be overwhelming to do so. So I also am offering here on this slide a reference to a tool that offers investigators and, and practitioners the opportunity to ask some key questions about usability, testability, applicability, and acceptability of the various models. Next slide. And just really quickly, a bit of a sampling. Here are some models that are commonly used in implementation research. And I would like to note that some are that there are some really great examples of application of these models in the literature. But re-aim uh, to the left side is one of the most frequently used frameworks for planning and evaluation of grant applications that have been has been applied across a wide variety of settings um, and health conditions. R stands for reach, E for effectiveness, and M for maintenance, which operate at the individual level or those who it, the intervention is intended to benefit then adoption, implementation, and maintenance, which focuses on the staff and setting level levels. Recently, Shelton and colleagues extended this model to integrate recent conceptualization of sustainability with, with a focus on addressing dynamic context and promoting equity. On the right is the EPIS framework, exploration, adoption, preparation, implementation, and sustainment model. And to the bottom left is a consolidated framework for implementation research or CFER. Both models are also often used in implementation research studies. Um, they focus, I highlight them here because they, they emphasize multi-level context. They also emphasize stakeholder or community engagement and an iterative process for including a community voice as well as using data-driven strategies. On the bottom right, I'll also note that the implementation science literature has really grown over the last several years in a really transdisciplinary way, integrating social epidemiology and behavioral science in a desire to explicitly, in, in, uh, uh, explicitly integrate health equity constructs. So Woodard and colleagues um, have um, published a health equity implementation framework or a determinant framework, which is an example that highlights social political forces, context, economies and physical structures. Next slide. So I do want to share um, a list of resources uh, and tools. You can find these resources at commonfund.nih.gov slash health disparities transformation slash applicant resources. These tools are freely available and open access for you. Thank you. I would now like to pass it on to my colleague, Cheryl Boyce, will provide guidance on how to submit your application. Thank you again to our panelists. We want you to submit your questions to cfhealthdisparities at mail.nih.gov if you have any questions. 
You can also email any of your scientific inquiries and plans for your individual research projects so that we may provide technical assistance. We will also have these slides and our frequently asked questions that will be posted and updated to our website. That's posted here on this slide. We look forward to receiving your grant application. And with that, this part of the session is adjourned. <laughs>